This is a story set in the future. Fast forward 40 years. I'll be 79 years old. And I've not been feeling too good lately. I've been feeling tired. After my daily game of space tennis, I've been feeling kind of out of breath. And I lost to a 110-year-old last week, and that's never happened before. So <laughs> I'm concerned, and I go to see my doctor. And my robo-doc scans me up and down and tells me that I have a disease called pulmonary fibrosis. If left untreated, then my life expectancy is around four or five years. And the only cure for this disease is a lung transplant. Now, I'm not concerned about having to go onto a organ donor waiting list until a suitable organ is available. And the reason I'm not concerned is because this is what's going to happen in 2056. Some cells will be taken, maybe from my blood, possibly from a skin biopsy. Those cells will go into a laboratory where they're grown, and they're reprogrammed to become lung cells. When there's enough of those lung cells, they'll be put through a machine called a bioprinter. And that bioprinter will fabricate a 3D structure that resembles a lung. After a few weeks, that lung will have matured to a stage where it's ready to be put back inside my body to replace the diseased organs. This whole process will take just a few months. And the beauty is that that lung that is implanted into me will contain my own cells, so there will be no chance of rejection. I won't have to spend the rest of my life on anti-rejection drugs and having to deal with all of the associated side effects. I'm a cell biologist and a tissue engineer, and I believe that 3D bioprinting is going to change the way we think about aging, and it's going to change the way we treat disease. So today, I hope to give you a little bit of a glimpse into how I think this is going to happen. Before we talk about 3D bioprinting, we have to understand what 3D printing is. Now, 3D printing is a concept that many of you are probably familiar with. It's also called additive manufacturing. And this is the process whereby a digital design for a 3D structure is fabricated layer by layer from the bottom up. Behind me, you can see a desktop 3D printer, which uses plastic to print out 3D models. In this case, it's printed out a plastic model of a house. Other 3D printers are being used to print other materials, such as metals. And, and these metal products are used in the aerospace and automotive industries as parts. Even quick dry concrete has been printed. And this opens up the possibility that one day we'll be printing the houses that we live in, not just plastic models of houses. So how is 3D bioprinting related to 3D printing? Well, in some ways, it's similar. We take a digital design for a structure, and that design is realized in a layer-by-layer -layer fashion. But that's really where the similarities end. Because instead of using plastics to print structures, we're using living cells mixed with biocompatible scaffolds to build living things. This is a colleague of mine, Sheng. He's working on a bioprinter. It's inside a sterile safety cabinet to keep the cells protected from viruses and bacteria. We combine the cells and the scaffolds into a fiber that's about the thickness of a human hair. And these fibers are laid down layer by layer to build a living three-dimensional tube. This could be a windpipe or a blood vessel. Here we're printing a lattice-like membrane that could potentially be a biological band-aid these structures are placed into a culture incubator that recreates the environment of the human body. So these tissues have to be grown. And this leads us to the fact that 3D bioprinting is more like 4D bioprinting, the fourth dimension being time. What you can see here is we're looking into one of our 3D printed 
structures immediately after we've printed it. Each of those green dots is an individual cell. And those cells are kind of isolated within their 3D matrix. This isn't really how tissues are formed. Cells don't like to be by themselves normally. They get lonely. After seven days in culture, these cells spread and they start to touch each other and interact in these interconnected networks. That, that printed structure has turned into a living tissue. So we can build living tissues. Can we print a human lung? Well, the answer is not yet. This is a plastic cast of the inside of a pair of human lungs. And what you see is this incredibly intricate branching network of tubes. Each of these tubes ends in an air sac, a tiny structure, which is where the oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged. To give you a, a, an idea of just how complex this structure is, there are 300 million of these tiny air sacs in each lung. So this is a very challenging structure to print, and we can't do this right now. But we can print parts of this tissue. We can print part of lungs and use them in a very useful way, and I'll describe how we do that. So surrounding your air tubes is a layer of muscle. And if you have asthma and you breathe in certain allergens, that muscle contracts. And as it contracts, it reduces the, the diameter of your airways and causes you to wheeze, and that's an asthma attack. What we can do is take those cells from those cells from the muscle of the airway, grow them in the lab, and then print them into tubular structures similar to the ones that you just saw being printed. Here we're looking directly down onto one of those printed muscle tubes. Now, if you look very carefully, you can see that tube contracting, relax, contracting. It's quite a subtle change. What we've done is we've added a compound called histamine. Histamine is released in your airways when you have an asthma attack, and it causes that muscle contraction. We can recreate this in the lab with our printed muscle tissues. So this small contraction is actually a really big deal, because this is the first time that anybody's been able to 3D print an airway muscle tissue and show this kind of biology, lifelike -like contraction. We call it an asthma attack in a dish. <laughs> now, we can't just recreate this contraction. What we can do is add drugs like Ventolin that's in your inhaler that you take when you have an asthma attack. And that reverses the contraction. So we can relax this air tube using an anti-asthma drug. The fact that we can test drugs in these tissues is a really important point. And it's important because the drug development industry has a really big challenge. And to understand this challenge, I'll describe how drugs are kind of developed. Before a drug can be tested in human trials, it has to be tested in what are called preclinical models. These preclinical models include cells grown in petri dishes and also animals often rodents, usually mice or rats. Now, the big challenge with using these particular preclinical models is that the human is more complex than just a layer of cells grown in a two-dimensional dish. <laughs> Our tissues, you know what's going to come next. Our tissues are really complex structures with cells interacting in three dimensions. And also, animals such as mice and rats respond very differently to drugs and other compounds than humans do. So <laughs> we're not the same as the animals that we test our drugs on. Consequently, there is a huge chasm between the preclinical tools that we use to test our drugs and the humans that the drugs are designed to help. So 90% of drugs that show promise in animals actually fail to work in humans, usually because they're just not effective at fighting disease, or sometimes they're downright toxic. We believe that these 3D printed tissues 
can help the drug development process by enabling us to test these compounds in tissues that reproduce that complexity of the human body. This will save lives. We'll get better drugs to patients faster and for less money. It also has a moral impact because we can drastically reduce the number of animals that are used for drug development. Now, 3D printing, 3D bioprinting, can help us reduce the use of animals in other ways as well. By the year 2050, it's estimated that we'll need around 100 billion land animals to supply us with our animal-based needs, such as meat, leather, milk, those kinds of things. Now, animal cells can be grown in the laboratory in just the same way as human cells. So there is a potential here to replace a large proportion of these animals by using bioprinted cells instead. We can take animal cells, we can differentiate them into muscle-like cells, and then print those cells into a meat product. The first bioprinted beef burger was revealed in 2013, and this is a picture of it here before it was cooked. Um, apparently, it was rather tasteless, <laughs> and it cost approximately $300,000. <laughs> kind of nouveau cuisine gone crazy. <laughs> so this isn't a, a realistic use for bioprinting yet, but the technology is moving forward rapidly. Bioprinted leather is also a potential use for this technology. Skin cells can be grown, and we could generate customized leather products with specific thicknesses or textures or even colors. So potentially, we can make not just replacement animal products, but even better animal products. So in 30 or 40 years' time, maybe you'll be walking down the street in your vegan bioprinted leather shoes. Maybe you'll be heading to an ethically sound restaurant to eat your bioprinted steak. You could even be breathing deeply into your healthy bioprinted lungs. But I guarantee you that way sooner than that, maybe in just a few years, you or someone you know will have been treated with a life-saving drug that was developed using bioprinted human tissues. Thank you very much.